Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another session where I happily interview the bloggers that I've selected to be part of my personal blog role. You know, the one down there, or it might be down there because I have no idea what Zoom flips my image, but look over to the right side of the blog, it's there. Lolly Davidson is an accredited professor, a scholar of English, and she also has her own personal blog. And Lolly, I am so happy you can be part of the of the, sun, the Saturday recording. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing this fine morning? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. And for those who don't who are not familiar with Lolly's blog, she discusses many topics, including fiction, how to write more cohesively, how to turn what is the equivalent of it was a dark and stormy night into it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Yeah, I, I kind of focus on magic realism. And um, I mean, that's, that's what I write. I write both very short stories and novels. For those readers who are not completely familiar, can you just give a, a example of what magic realism would be like an equivalent of? Yeah, it's not fantasy and it's not romance and it's not sci-fi. It's kind of like a hybrid form. It actually originated from South America. And today I think there's other words for it like um, fabulism. You might hear it, um, the fantastic. Sometimes it's lumped in with speculative fiction, but it's kind of like a, like I said, it's like a hybrid. What I like to say is it's kind of like you're high <laughs> and everything's real, but it's a little strange and yet more true than you ever thought it was. Sounds like something Alan Moore would put together. Yeah, it's uh, the reason they say it comes from South America. I mean, some people say it's only South American, but I really think it's it's all over. Like I would call, um, uh, you know, the guy who wrote Metamorphosis, um, I'm forgetting his name at the moment. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's kind of surrealism. And I think it's the product of, of the clash of several cultures and also of extreme political kind of um, upheaval. You know, sort of what we all experienced in this last four years. <laughs> Definitely. Um, not to be a nasty name dropper or anything, I. One of the, the great uh, writers of my generation uh, once imparted some knowledge upon me, uh, the great William Kennedy, where he said that a good writer every day should write one page. Mm -hmm. You can write one page every day. By the end of the year, you will have a novel. Yeah. You know, I never used to do that, um, but I have become much more constant in my writing practice. I don't think it has to be every day, but I do think, you know, you should aim for three or four or five times a week. And um, I think it was Neil Gaiman who said, the first 30 minutes are gonna be complete garbage and then it gets better. And he said, if I could figure out how to skip the first 30 minutes, I would, but I can't. So you have to kind of be willing to write badly and then, um, and you rewrite, you know. And of course, that's one of the most important things. You can't just pop an entire novel out in one in one sitting. You're, you go through rewrites and rewrites and re 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 rewrites. Yeah. Do you also find that when you blog that your initial concept sometimes needs to go through two or three different or 20 different iterations? Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, I would love to turn out my blogs a lot faster, um, but, uh, and I'm trying to do that, but I, it, uh, you know, you just, you just have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And most of my rewriting involves actually cutting words because I think we, we tend to say things two or three times and with way more words than we need to. So yeah, it's endless. Is that like uh, use, use instead of utilize, utilize? Right, right. <laughs> totally understand. I also uh, am aware that you are a professor, I believe, at um, Adirondack College up in uh, upstate New York. Yep. Yeah, I teach um, writing fiction, um, science fiction, and, you know, uh, entry-level composition courses and public speaking. 
in teaching science fiction, of course, the evolution of science fiction has grown from the pulp magazines of of the early you know nineteen thirties, you know, all the way to the Robert Heinleins and you know Dune, and then the you know, advent of television, the Star Trek versus Star Wars dichotomy, all the way up to you know modern modern science fiction. Mm-hmm. For the evolution of of fiction itself as part of science fiction, what are some of the main themes that you have noticed going back, let's say, to the days of the pulps up until what we're dealing with uh, in science fiction today? Well, it's kind of interesting because there has always been a kind of a love-hate relationship in science fiction with science. So you'll find there's a kind of a flip-flopping that occurs. Like it started with um, actually um, Frankenstein uh, and, um, uh, oh my gosh, my, my, my memory is not working today, um, Hawthorne, weirdly enough. And in those books, there's a you know, suspicion about science. Science is kind of evil, is going to destroy us, is bad. But then you go into the pulp fiction and science is wonderful and, and you know, it's, it's going to create these big inventions that are going to liberate us and make us powerful. And then there's a turning back. Um, I think when you go to something like um, Neuromancer by William Gibson, there's a kind of a schizophrenic relationship with science. It's both, both usurping us and taking our bodies and taking over our minds in a kind of a dangerous way, but it's also kind of all that's left. For those who are not familiar with Neuromancer, it's technically really the first true cyberpunk novel out there with the the melding of electronic and and biometrics. Yeah. Or or think about it as a more redefined version of the $6 million man. Yeah, and he is credited with inventing the term cyberspace. When, when you're writing, whether it's for the blog or your own speculative fiction or your realism fiction, what are some of the inspirations that you can normally go to that will inspire you to create some of your best work? Well, I mean, it changes depending on what I'm writing, but I do find that if I'm reading a book that I think, ooh, I like the way this is written. Like I like the, um, I just read um, Jess Walter's Cold Millions and it's, uh, the point of view is, it's multiple points of view. And I, and I love the way he did that, including the point of view of people who die at the end of the, sec- of the session that, that they're in. And I thought, oh, I, I didn't realize you could do that. So, so sometimes it's, um, you know, authors, but I would say for me, the most inspiring thing is setting, weirdly enough. Like whenever I'm writing a scene that's kind of not going anywhere or that I'm kind of lost in, if I research the setting a little bit and then write about the setting, it, it literally puts the people in a place, it grounds them, and then they start to function properly. It's almost as if without setting, they're kind of floating around and you can't figure out what's going on. One of the, by the, by the same token, you also have these moments where you run into the writer's block. The, you can't get past that one moment and it can be frustrating. I mean, I get it all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think every good writer out there runs into it at one point or another. When you experience writer's block in any way, shape or form, what are some of your personal techniques to work around it or to eliminate it? That's a great question. And I've had a lot of experience with writer's blocks. Uh, Some people say it doesn't exist, but I think what it is, is that the people who say that it doesn't exist, it's that they don't call it that. They, They run into periods where they can't write and they do other things. Like, you know, sometimes you do need to get up and, you know, clean behind the radiator. And as you're cleaning behind the radiator, you start thinking about your story and you come up with a solution. So some of us might say, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't do my work. I went away and I cleaned the radiator instead of writing. But other people might say, no, I needed to think about it. Um, So I would say for me though, um, so knowing when to walk away and take a walk and do something else and kind of um, let go of it and do that kind of loose, fuzzy thinking 
And then the other thing that's really, really helpful is um, if, you, if you can't write it, write about it. So if you're kind of like, I'm stuck, I don't know what to write. Instead of just sitting there staring at the page, you start writing out all your thoughts of like, well, I was thinking of maybe doing this, and, and but then I here's my problem with that. And I could do this. And you just kind of like talk aloud on paper. And I find that almost always kickstarts me. That uh, it gets me. I within seconds, I know what I want to do next. And within that, you also run into, I guess, the equivalent for me when I look at, at a writer's block is, uh, I just say, "What would George R. R. Mountain do?" And I would think, well, fifteen years later, he might put the paper into the typewriter for the next novel. <laughs> Yeah. And I just have to figure, well, if I if he takes 15 years to put a piece of paper in there, I can certainly work a little faster than that. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting that William Kennedy said something about writing every day because um, I had, had invited him to be part, you know, to read at one of the original reading um, uh, events of the Writers Project, which I started at SUNY Adirondack. This was like 10 or 15 years ago. And he said that he, uh, will take notes on a novel sometimes for two years before he even starts to write it. So he said he would develop like, you know, like a stack of notes this big and he wouldn't even necessarily look at them again, but it was sort of like he, it was kind of like he was writing about it for two years. And then when he was ready, he would write it. But he also said that he rewrote um, Ironweed many, many times, 15 times. And it, he put it on the shelf many times, he gave up, he took characters out, he put characters in, he turned it into a screenplay. You know, I mean, it just went through a lot of iterations. So that, I find that comforting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, if you can, if whatever you put together in your book suddenly becomes a movie with Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, that's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with my my luck, anything I write, I'll probably turn into a movie with Zach, with uh, Jack Black and Captain <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> Maybe so. Um, I had asked another of the bloggers in an interview, Amy Biancoli, about her inspirations, the, the professors, the teachers that inspired her in college. We both went to college together. She did a lot better than I did. <laughs> I was going to say, who were some of the educators, the professors, the teachers the instructors that really inspired you to become a writer? Well, I had a pretty bad experience actually in college uh, where the creative writing, the person who was the head of the department was terrible and did and, and told me to stop writing. And um, so that was not an inspiration. It was quite the opposite. But in graduate school, I would say Judith Johnson was a wonderful inspiration. She, um, she said something I'll never forget. She said, sometimes when you're finding there's a problem with a piece, instead of trying to fix the problem and take the problem out, do more of it, like exaggerate the problem. And I found that to be also a wonderful kind of trick. The format for fiction has evolved based on the medium that it's stored on. We've mm -hmm. gone from books, we now have audio plays. We've gone to, you know, one page read, uh, read for 10 cents on Amazon. How has that affected the story by the medium that it's participating in? That's a tough one because there's so many different mediums. Um, I will say that, you know, the most, the most, um, noticeable development, but I don't know if this is because of media is, you know, the flash fiction development, this, this, um, uh, the popularity, the rise in the popularity of very, very short fictions. And I think, you know, as our attention spans get shorter, um, you know, think I was thinking like things like Vine and TikTok, these tiny little short 60 second videos, and, and we're doing sort of the same thing with our fiction too. And I, I think it's a wonderful form. I really love flash fiction. It's kind of a, a hybrid between a poem and a short story. Um, and I find the compression is wonderful for 
it's actually helped me even in writing novels because when you work in that microscopic way where you have to weigh every single word to see if it's really necessary, when you turn to something larger and sprawling like a novel, you start to see a kind of a lot of waste. So I think it kind of helps you get to the action faster. I mean, not that it's all about action either. I mean, my, my writing is very much about thought and reflection, but um, people have a tendency to go on and on. Like if uh, my mother keeps saying, oh, you know, you should read like Charles Dickens and like, you know, learn a few things from him. But the thing about Charles Dickens, I mean, he's wonderful, but he just takes so much time to say stuff. We don't, we don't have that kind of time anymore. Yeah, I mean, you can't really sit on the bus and read Nicholas Nickleby unless you're riding a bus to Los Angeles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As a writer, you and I have both experienced getting our works published. Can you, for, for the readers here, for the viewers, give us a great example of the moment when one of your pieces that you were extremely proud of was published for the first time? Boy, you know, I don't actually, I don't remember the first time. Um, usually, I have to say that usually it's a, in terms of like um, short stories, uh, you know, it takes a long time for it to come out between when it's been accepted and when you see it in print. So it's kind of a anticlimactic and then, uh, you know, when my novel was accepted for publication, it was kind of a revelation because it was something that I, I had been waiting for my whole life. And uh, suddenly I realized, oh, it's really going to be out there. Like it's going to be committed to the page and I'm not going to be able to keep revising. And suddenly I thought, oh, this is, this is terrifying. I, maybe I don't want to be published. <laughs> I know that I, I kind of understand where you're coming from. I mean, when I finally got around, I, I, I part of the blog of mine, every so often I used to write this fiction story that was a continuation. I think I made it through like 51 chapters through the blog. And then last year when I was recovering from an injury, I tried to combine it all into one book. And I'm like, I wrote this over a span of eight years. What the heck was I thinking? <laughs> Yeah, it really is. Um, and suddenly you're not sure you want everybody seeing it, you know. Right. Or, or you look at, oh, something I wrote in 2014. I don't think this works anymore. I need to edit this. this mm -hmm. to, yeah, take this character out, put a new one in, change this name. And mm -hmm. yeah. when, when people do get published, and this is a follow-up question, there are so many avenues out there. There's writer's guides, there's calls for contests. What are some of the best places for a beginning writer to get his or her work received? And what are some of the worst places that anybody should consider? Um, I always like Poets and Writers Inc. because they, um, it's, you know, it's pw.org. Um, and it's free. I mean, you can subscribe to support them and at some point you should, but um, meanwhile, there's a lot of resources that you can use for free and you can go and check out little magazines and then read all about them. And those are wonderful because you can spend a lot of time kind of not only reading about the magazines, but then going and checking out the magazines to see if it's a good match for your fiction or whatever it is you're writing. And then most of the submissions are electronic. So that's that's really wonderful. So pw.org, I think Writer's Digest is pretty good too. The worst places, I don't know if I could say, but I would say anybody who wants to charge you $80 to publish your work, that's a scam. You know, like, don't do that. There are some of these scam things where like, oh, your book, you know, your, your thing has been accepted to be part of an anthology and it'll only cost you $80 to buy the book. And that's a total scam. So just avoid anything like Presses that. Presses almost. Yeah, so I think, uh, but it is normal on, if you go to pw.org and look up what little, little magazines, um, there usually is a small submission charge of like $3, which is acceptable. And then like contests can be more expensive, like $25. But I don't 
tend to do contests that much because they are expensive. And I guess the other piece of advice that's really important is to understand that you're going to be rejected a lot. So you, if you send out, um, you know, 70 works, or if you send out a, a one work to 70 places, you know, maybe you'll get it published, you know, like you could, you should ex expect about a 5% acceptance rate. So that's a, that's a lot of no's to get to a few yeses. And one of the most important things, especially for a writer, retain your copyright whenever possible. Yeah. Never give the copyright away. Yeah. yeah read that contract and if there's anything you don't understand don't ask them go find a very respected lawyer and have him or her read the thing to you and explain it to you like you're five yeah uh, yeah i had to actually turn down a publication of my novel because the um public the publisher wanted to uh, under the copyright they had edited by the you know by the editor who had just done copy editing and it was right there kind of on the same line as my copyright. And I thought that it would be, mis it could easily be mis mistaken that it was a copyright by, you know, Lolly Davidson edited by so-and-so. And I thought that was unacceptable and they wouldn't change it. So I had to say no to being published in that instance. I yeah. felt like at that point, it's like it, I was better off self-publishing than giving up my copyright. Right. I mean, if they're saying to you, we can't change it, there's got to be a reason why. And the reason may not be what you want to hear. Right. Right. Um, I have seen a, a lot of these contests online, like people will put a post up on Twitter, say, um, write a story about such and use six words. Mm -hmm. those, yeah. have got, those have got to be extremely tough to put together. Yeah, the famous one everybody uh, quotes is the Hemingway, uh, baby shoes for sale, never used. Yeah, I, I, I do remember that story, yes. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the scary thing is, though, there are, I mean, it can be an exercise that will challenge your writing skills and your ability to put something together. Mm -hmm. But at the same token, so many of these people are putting these out. You don't know if these are contests to actually in, improve your exposure as a writer, or if it's some sort of content generator for them. Or, yeah. Or even worse, if they try to use something like that to maybe infiltrate into your social media network, mm -hmm. bombard all your friends with like adware and stuff. Yeah, I don't think I would, I, I think you're right. I would not, I would not do something on Twitter. You know, I would, I usually go to Poets and Writers Inc to get my, you know, publication information there. And then within that, you can check to see if the magazine is part of, um, I forget the name of it, it's CL, CLMP or something. It's a, it's a conglomerate of like, um, magazines that adhere to a certain set of ethics. And so if they're part of that, then they are saying things like really any contest should be, it should be judge blind. It shouldn't be judged with names on it. So I, I wouldn't submit to anything that isn't judge blind. Cause then you're just, you know, they're who knows they're just collecting money and, um, and publishing their friends. You know? <laughs> and also if you are gonna write for some, a publication make sure that your work is suitable for that publication and follows their guidelines, not just in punctuation and formatting, but also in content and type. You may be the greatest sword and sorcery writer, but it probably doesn't fit when you're writing for a medical journal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, it is CLMP. It's Community of Literary Magazines and Presses. And that is a kind of a, it's kind of like a, almost a certifying um, organization that sort of says we adhere to these certain standards. Okay. A couple more questions on our Saturday morning conversation. With the evolution of blogging, both you and I are veterans of the same, where do you feel that blogging will progress into the future? Well, I don't know. 
but I am already kind of switching over to doing TikToks and then posting my TikToks on my blog. And I'm finding that those get a lot more likes and views than just a, a written blog. So I think, I think everything is going to audible video. You know, I think we are entering a post literate, post, you know, uh, age, you know, sort of like civilization has these shifts. Like we went, there was a certain point where in civilization we didn't write things down and then we began to write things down and uh, now I think we're getting into, we're not, we're, we're kind of digital literacy mm -hmm. so, for better or for worse. But I, I listen to a lot of my books by Audible and prefer that. So I think that's where we're going in general. Okay. And then that was going to be my, my final question was, you're, you, I believe, are my first ever person on my blog roll that also has their own TikTok. <laughs> Did you get roped into TikTok and... By the same token, how good are you at those crazy ass TikTok dances? I don't do those. And I have to say, I'm probably not that popular on TikTok. I'm probably, it's, I don't know. I'm not sure it's the right audience. Like I do think the, the videos that I do that are funny, those get a lot more views. The ones that are serious often get nothing. So I'm thinking that I, I'm sort of exploring it. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, my daughter who's 20 said, yeah, as soon as the old people get on it, we go on to something else. Like, you know, they used to do Facebook, then we got on and they got off and started doing, um, you know, Instagram, but then we got on Instagram. So they got off and started doing TikTok and now we're getting on TikTok and they're going to go find something else. <laughs> I hear MySpace is a place they might be going <laughs> with their Netscape browsers. <laughs> <laughs> Lolly Davidson, thank you so much for being part of a Saturday with us. And um, by all means, if you have any web links or anything that you'd like to promote right now, by all means, please share. Okay, well, just check out lollydavidson.com and then you'll find links from there to the TikTok and all of that. And Franz Kafka was the author I was trying to think of in the beginning who wrote um, Metamorphosis about the guy who wakes up as a cockroach. Um, so I think that's magic realism, but uh, some would say that's just surrealism. I don't know. Well, you know, I would, I would almost, uh, where you go to Franz Kafka, I sort of end up going to Jack Kirby. So hmm. I, oh, I still Kirby. argue that some of the, some of the greatest fiction from the past 50 years have come from the 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 graphic novels the marvels the dcs the dark horses mm -hmm. let's face it watchmen yeah road yeah. to Christian. that was great yep yep great stuff lolly davidson thank you so All much right. thank you bye-bye